of Jerusalem. We're going to look at that verse. What is a song of Solomon all about? Well, just as a quick introduction, it's an inspired book on marriage. God has a book in the Bible about marital love. The characters in here are King Solomon and an unnamed woman who was a Shulamite, Shulamite woman. And in this book, she does most of the talking, although there are places where King Solomon is talking. And it's all about their wonderful relationship and how much she loves Solomon and how much he loves her and how much she looks forward to seeing him. And when he doesn't show up when he should, how upset she is and sad she is, how she's so proud of him. All you daughters in Jerusalem, look at this man. He's the greatest man. I mean, just absolutely some tremendous things are said in this book. But most commentators will say another purpose of the Song of Solomon is to give us a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus is called a bridegroom and his church is called his bride. There is a day when there will be a wedding between Jesus Christ as the bridegroom and his church. Now, that's made up of true Christians now. People who are truly born again all around the world, those people are a part of the Lord's universal church. All of them will be the ones that will be a part of the wedding ceremony with Christ up in heaven. And of course, it will be a splendid time a time when there's a great wedding supper that's described also in the Bible, many great things about it. And many say this Song of Solomon shows the relationship of Jesus Christ to his church. And it's interesting to study that. I have before, I have taught through Song of Solomon a couple of times in my years of being here, and we've looked at both angles at the marital instructions that are in this book, and secondly, at how it pictures Christ and his church. But today, I'm not doing all of that. I just wanted to give you background. I want you to look at this one verse here, Song of Solomon 5.16. It's describing the Shulamite's husband, Solomon. But I believe it certainly describes our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some great things are said about him here, which I hope you can say about him. I hope there's not a more important person in your life than the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that made you. He's the one that saved you. He's the one that's taking you to heaven and preparing a place for you. He is the one that you're going to spend eternity with. Definitely, he ought to be the most important person in this life to each and every Christian. But the question is, is he? If he is, I believe some things said here will be true about what we can say. Dear Lord, thank you for this time around your word. I pray, Lord, as we look at this particular verse this morning and we're thinking of our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who we preached on all this year. And Lord, we can never preach enough about him. He is absolutely infinite beyond our ability to totally and completely understand. But we have your word and have much about Jesus in your word. And the things this verse mentions about him are true throughout the Bible. So, Lord, use me this morning. I pray of all things, Lord, we would certainly draw closer to the Savior today, realizing the truths found in this one verse about him. In his precious, wonderful name, the sweetest name I know, we choir sang earlier, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, notice, if you will, please, the parts of this verse. First of all, 
Here it says, his mouth is most sweet. As you think of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, you think of what comes out of it. Wonderful words of life, the, psalm, the songer, songwriter said. Wonderful words of life come from the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ speaks, it's right here in his word what he says to us. And this is a wonderful word so the point I'm trying to make is today, if you really love the Lord Jesus and his mouth is sweet to you, you're going to love his word. Seriously. Where can you know anything at all about Jesus Christ without the Bible? Now, there are historical records. And last Sunday, I mentioned the Encyclopedia Britannica has over 20,000 words about Jesus Christ in the Encyclopedia Britannica. We talked about him being a historical character because some idiots are coming out today and said, Jesus didn't really exist. He's just a figure of imagination. Well, we gave you a several sources, just a sampling of all the sources that are out there, not even Christian sources. Sources of Josephus, who lived at the time of Christ, a Jewish historian that refers to Jesus and talks about what a wonderful man he was. He didn't believe he was necessarily the Messiah because he was a Jewish historian. But he talks about him writing in 52 AD. I have his book in my library. It's been translated into English. It's a great history book. Much things regarding the Holy Land are in his book that are outside of what's in the Bible. And historians have been absolutely following up on much Josephus has said in his book for ages and found them mostly true. The things that he said that happened and took place. So, Basically, it's not a matter of talking about Jesus as a historical person, which there are some other references to him in other places about that, but it's about who we know him. God manifest in the flesh, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. We're dependent upon this word for that. And let me tell you today, this word has some wonderful words of Jesus for you. One of the greatest ones is found in John 10, 28, for instance. He says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Jesus is talking about his sheep. He's talking about his people that have trusted him as their Savior. He says, I give you eternal life. Are you looking forward to that today? As we get older, it gets more and more important to us. Because we know it's just a little while till we'll be experiencing that eternal life. Thank Jesus for saying, I give you eternal life. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to have so much money in the bank to get to heaven. You don't have to be 99% good, 75% good. Have your good works outweigh your bad works. That's not the way it works anyway. All of our righteousnesses, Isaiah 64, 6 says, are as filthy rags in God's eyes. So he's not going to accept us for what you've done. But what Jesus does is offer you his free salvation. He did all the work. He paid for our sins by dying on the old rugged cross and shedding his blood to wash him away. He absolutely bore all of our sins in his body on the tree, the Bible says. Died, buried, but resurrected the third day. Victorious over sin and death. And as a result of that, he can now say, I give unto you eternal life and ye shall never perish. Oh, there's a starting point for the wonderful words of Jesus. But Jesus also tells us some other words. I think of what he said in John chapter number 16. He said there, My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. The world looks at peace 
as absolutely no wars, no fightings, everybody getting along, everything going totally smoothly in life. However, as you well know, that's not the way life is. There are ups and downs and problems and difficulties all through life. And Jesus is talking about his peace that again he will freely give to us if we will just simply trust him for everything in life. If we'll realize what Timothy sang, my father planned it all. God knows your beginning of days and your end of days and everything in between those days. He knows all that's going to happen to you before it happens. And he looks at each one of us as his children and he says, this is the way I want this one to glorify me. This is the way I want this one to glorify me. And our paths in life are not all the same. Some people, God allows to have money and use that money for him. Some people absolutely are dirt poor as far as money's concerned, but rich in faith to show how much they trust God for everything in their life. Example, George Mueller in England, who had hundreds and hundreds of children go through his orphanage, and he didn't have enough money to run it at all. He was poor and prayed it all in. Sometimes have as many as 95 children to feed per day, not having any food, getting along with God and praying, Lord, please send in the food today. I have to have it by supper time. And then there'd be a knock at the door and somebody would say, boy, we had a whole bunch of bread left over at the bakery today. We thought we'd bring it by here. Or other miraculous things. A poor man that God used in wonderful ways. That was the plight for him. For other people, it might be, boy, good health and praise God for the good health and strength you have. Amen? Other people, it may be all kinds of struggles their whole life. Conditions, issues. Oh, we could wish we didn't have them, but that's the way God will get the most glory out of our life. Do you ever really seriously contemplate what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all of the glory of God. As Christians... Mundane things or big things, our whole life is to bring glory to God. When we get a hold of that, then you have peace in your heart. You know God's working all things together for your good. It doesn't mean you're going to be floating on cloud nine through this life. You're going to have battles and struggles and difficulties, but you know the Lord's with you. You know he absolutely is teaching you patience, endurance, James chapter 1. He's teaching you experiences to expand your faith and trust him more. God knows what he's doing in our lives. But listen to his words. I give unto you peace. The Lord wants to give unto us joy, John chapter 15. As we abide in him and his words abide in us, your joy shall be full. Oh, how wonderful that is. I'm just talking a little bit about what's in the Bible this morning. When it says his mouth is sweet, there's not a sweeter mouth than Jesus. And what comes out of his mouth? A Christian worker entered a home that was very poverty-stricken one time. Beneath a rickety table, he saw a dust-covered Bible. As he left, he said, There's a treasure in this house which, if discovered and believed, would make you all rich. 
When they all heard that, a diligent search was made, turning everything upside down, tearing up boards in the floor, trying to find that hidden treasure. Could it be a jewel, a pot of gold, a lump of money? They asked each other and searched and searched and searched, but couldn't find that earthly treasure. But not long after, the mother was fooling around under that rickety table and found the old Bible. She began to go through the pages of the unread Bible. On the fly leaf was written these words, somebody put them there, Thy testimonies are better to me than thousands of gold and silver. Comes from the Proverbs. Oh, she exclaimed, could this be the treasure that stranger spoke of? She called all the members of the family together. They read the Bible. They accepted the Lord. A change came into their lives. And they truly said, we are now rich forever. Not a greater treasure than the Bible. Listen to this little poem. Precious things of wealth untold, stores of silver and of gold, God hides off within the ground till by seeking they are found. In his word he's hidden too, riches that he means for you. Search the scripture's precious store as the miner digs for ore, finding wisdom not of earth, far above a ruby's worth. Search and you'll be, you will surely find treasures to enrich your mind. Search the scriptures every day. Search and find they're hidden away like a pearl within a shell, promises that fears dispel. Search and find God's words impart treasures to enrich the heart. Search the scriptures finding there Christ, its chiefest treasure rare, through whom God makes wealth abound in each life where he is found. Search and find what Christ will do to enrich all life. For you. Yes, the Bible. Is Jesus' mouth, as found here, lovely to you? Do you read the Bible? Do you study it? Are you committing it to heart as I'm trying to get you to do Sunday by Sunday and memorize the scriptures? Oh, let me tell you, it will absolutely enthrall you knowing Jesus and his word. Secondly, this verse said, his mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. Jesus is special to those who know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. You would never take his name in vain. You would never criticize him. You would never allow anything in your life to put bad light on Jesus Christ. The world certainly does. And doesn't it make you cringe when they use the Lord's name in vain? Isn't it sad to see more and more bold people come out and say Jesus wasn't a real historical figure? Jesus is not the Savior. Jesus is not at all what Christians tell you. Isn't that sad to hear people talk those ways? Well, I'll tell you today, to us, he's altogether lovely. There's not a more spatial person in this world than Jesus Christ. As some of the songs say, his name is wonderful. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. Is he? Is he special to you? I trust he is. As you know him as your Savior and get in his word and study about him. And by the way, you can see Jesus in every book of the Bible. Did you know that? Let me just take a moment. Just take a little bit of time, but not long. Jesus in every book of the Bible. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman in Shiloh. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, the anointed high priest. In Numbers, the star of Jacob and brazen serpent. In Deuteronomy, prophet like Moses and the great rock. In Joshua, captain of the Lord's host. In Judges, messenger of Jehovah. In Ruth, the kinsman redeemer. In 1 Samuel, the great judge. In 2 Samuel, the seed of David. In 1 Kings, Lord God of Israel. In 2 Kings, God of the cherubim. 
In 1 Chronicles, God of our salvation. In 2 Chronicles, God of our fathers. In Ezra 1, he's the Lord of heaven and earth. In Nehemiah, he's the covenant-keeping God. In Esther, the God of providence. In Job, risen and returning redeemer. In Psalms, the anointed son, the holy one, the good shepherd, and the king of glory. Just a few in the Psalms. Proverbs, the wisdom of God. Ecclesiastes, the one above the sun. Song of Solomon, chiefest among 10,000 and altogether lovely. Isaiah, virgin born Emmanuel, child, son, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, righteous servant, man of sorrows, just a few in Isaiah. In Jeremiah, the Lord our righteousness. In Lamentations, the faithful and compassionate God. In Ezekiel, the Lord who is there. In Daniel, smiting stone, son of God, son of man. Hosea, king of the resurrection. Joel, god of the battle and giver of the spirit. Amos, god of hosts and of the plumb line. Obadiah, destroyer of the proud. Jonah, the risen prophet, god of second choices, the long-suffering one. Micah, god of Jacob, the Bethlehemite and the pardoning god. Nahum, the avenging god and bringer of good tidings. Habakkuk, the everlasting, pure, glorious, and anointed one. Zephaniah the king of Israel, Haggai, desire of all nations, Zechariah, the branch, the builder of the temple, the king of the triumphal entry, pierced one, king of the earth, among many in Zechariah, Malachi, the lord of remembrance, in Matthew, the king of the Jews, in Mark, the servant, in Luke, the son of man, in John, the eternal God, in Acts, the ascended lord, in Romans, the lord our righteousness, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, our resurrection. 2 Corinthians, the God of all comfort. In Galatians, redeemer from the law. In Ephesians, head of the church and giver of gifts. Philippians, supplier of every need and obedient servant. In Colossians, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In 1 Thessalonians, the coming Christ. In 2 Thessalonians, the consuming Christ. In 1 Timothy, mediator and savior of sinners. In 2 Timothy, righteous and rewarding judge and author of scripture. In Titus, our great God and Savior. In Philemon, the payer of all of our debt. In Hebrews, the anointed heir of all things, one better than the prophets and angels, captain of our salvation, merciful and faithful high priest, great intercessor, mediator of the new covenant, great shepherd of the sheep among others. What a book. James, ever-present God, great physician and the coming one. In 1 Peter, unblemished land, great example, chief shepherd, Lord of glory. 2 Peter, the beloved son. 1 John, word of life, advocate, propitiation, and son of God. In 2 John, son of the father. In 3 John, the truth. In Jude, the preserver and only wise God. In Revelation, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the line of Judah, the slain and angry lamb, the king of kings, the bright and morning star, among others. Every book of the Bible has something about Jesus Christ. He is altogether lovely. Get to know him. Get in the word. Get to know Jesus Christ. Notice next. This is my beloved. Notice the my. While Jesus Christ is said in scripture to be the God who created all things, the God who created, of course, all of mankind. And on the earth right now, there are seven billion plus people, too many to even fathom or try to count. Do you know you couldn't count to seven billion in your lifetime? Try it. One, two, three, four. Can't make it. Seven billion is a huge, huge number. In fact, every second that passes off the clock, if you went for one week from today, it would just be about 1.5 million. That's all in one week that you could count to if you went one, two, three. You could only count to 1.5 million in one week. Which, of course, that means if you go a whole year, you'd only get to 500 million. Then, of course, it'd take two years to get to 1 billion. And we're talking about seven billion. Long time involved in getting to a number like that. Here's the point. Though Jesus Christ knows all those people, 
and loves all people, for God so loved the world, he wants to be every person's individual Savior. And when you accept him as your Savior, then he becomes my beloved. He belongs to you. Jesus talks about this wonderful relationship in the Gospel of John chapter 10. Just real quickly, a few verses there to show you this wonderful, beloved relationship between Jesus and his people. Notice, first of all, he says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. We never forget that. In verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. He knows us all, every single sheep. Then in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Jesus knows us, his sheep know him, and we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We can call him my beloved can you call him my beloved here today? Oh, how wonderful it is to see that. Uh, there was a preacher in the past, and uh, his name was Henry Lees. He was asked one time, do you really and truly know the Lord? This man said, Lord, I don't know if I know you all I should, but I want to know you. I realize I have you. So, Lord, if I have you, I have all I need and I do get to know you. And he quoted this to the fellow who asked him. Jesus is all this poor world needs. Blindly they strive, for sin darkens their way. Oh, to draw back the grim curtains of night. One glimpse of Jesus and all will be bright. All that I want is Jesus. He satisfies, joy he supplies. Life would be worthless without him. All things in Jesus I find. Can you agree with Pastor Lees? I hope you can. That Jesus is my beloved. Notice. And this is my friend. Proverbs tells us over in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 24, it says there, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Well, I'll tell you who that is. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus told us, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Do you believe that? Is there any place you go, Jesus is not there? Is there anything you face but what he's not there right with you? The answer is no, he's there. He's there 24-7. He is with you every day of your life until he takes you home to heaven. The problem is not with Jesus being there. The problem with is, is with us recognizing he's there, realizing he's there. That big appointment you have to face tomorrow or this week. Jesus will be there with you. He'll absolutely be ready for you to pray and say, Lord, help me. He will. Lord, see me through this. He will. Lord, absolutely give me peace of heart and mind about this. He will. Whatever you want your friend to do, Jesus is there to do for you. He's with you, my friend. That's why I like the 23rd Psalm, don't you? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You can have this great shepherd as your personal friend. He wants to be, is he? We sang the song earlier. What a friend I have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Jesus is interested in everything. Seems like we 
misplaced and can't find things in our house more and more all the time. But you know, if you'll just stop and say, Lord, help us to find this, that he does. Sometimes it's not immediate. Sometimes it's a little later and it shows up. And we say, how do we overlook that? <laughs> it's practically in plain sight. But the Lord reveals it. You say, is Jesus interested in helping you find things you lose in your house? Yes. If he's your friend, and he is if you're a Christian, he's right there to help you with everything in life. The problem is we just don't include him enough. We don't realize how great a friend he is to us. You know, these are amazing statements. But not only does God give you eternal life, but when you get to heaven, you become joint heirs of Jesus for everything up there. Do you know that? Read it in Romans chapter 8. The Lord is making you joint heirs of everything he owns, of everything he's ever going to do. You're right there. So when he's doing it for you out there, he wants to do it for you here. Be involved with everything here. But he will not force his way on you. He wants you to ask his help. Ask his direction. Ask for wisdom. Ask for strength. Ask for victory in your life. He wants you to ask. And he's right there as your friend, my friend, to help you along life's way. Praise the Lord for that. Then notice at the conclusion, it says, this is my beloved, this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. The speaker here is giving testimony of this great, wonderful man, Solomon, to everybody else. And I thought, you know, here's the last thing about Jesus. He wants to be so special to us that we want to share him with everyone else. Is there a greater person anyone can get to know than Jesus? No. He's the greatest. He's the fairest of 10,000 to our souls, as the song says. No better one. Years ago, there was a steamboat on the Mississippi River. On this particular steamboat was a crewman. And that crewman was on that ship inter welcoming people to get on the boat to sail down the Mississippi River. Whenever people would get in there, he would stop them a moment and say, please, for one minute, look up there. There's the captain. I want you to see the captain. Well, some of them would go on. Others would say, well, what's so special about the captain? Why do you want us to look at the captain? And the man said, because years ago, I fell off this steamboat. That captain left his high and lofty position, jumped in the Mississippi River at peril to his own life, and rescued me, a simple crewman on the ship. He rescued me, and from that day on, I want people to see him because I just likes to point him out. I thought, wow. How we ought to be that way about Jesus. We ought to just like to point him out. He saved our soul from eternal destruction. He's given us that home in heaven and he wants that for everyone. The Lord's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. And he uses you and me to get that message out. The Lord wants other people to know how special he is. And if he's special to you, you ought to just love to point him out. But do we? We clam up about this one who's our Savior, who's our Lord, who's altogether lovely, 
this one who is my beloved, my friend. And we don't say anything about him. Oh, God help us to be like this Shunammite woman. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem, you've got to see this one who's absolutely got a wonderful mouth, wonderful words, who's altogether lovely, who's my beloved, my friend. You've got to know him. We ought to be that way about Jesus and be willing to give a witness for him. Men, I'll speak directly to you. The stakeout, great opportunity to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Here's what I'd encourage you to do. Right now, in your heart and mind, think of someone you know that needs the Savior. And undoubtedly you know someone. It could be a relative, family member, a friend, a neighbor. And then pray over them. And in the next week or so, say, Lord, give me the courage and help me. I'm going to go and invite them to come to the stakeout. Here's an opportunity for them to come and receive a free steak and have some fun things we're going to be doing. But the main thing is to hear the gospel message. Wouldn't you be thrilled if your family member, your relative, your neighbor, your friend trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior and will spend eternity with you in heaven forever and ever and ever? We've got to use our opportunities. So I encourage you. Realize we want to point Jesus out. And here's an opportunity to do it. I close with this poem, which kind of sums up the whole message by Dr. John R. Rice. Jesus is such a Savior. Jesus is such a friend. Never forsakes nor leaves me, nor fails my needs to send. Jesus who died to save me, Jesus who sought for me, now with his love surrounds me. Oh, what a friend is he. Now in his love I glory, rest and rejoice in him. Blood bought and dear to Jesus, my joy is full within. Nothing then I'm persuaded can take me from his hand, nor height, nor depth, nor powers, Satan, nor self, nor man. Why should you slight the Savior? Why turn from him away? Where will you find forgiveness, loving care night and day? Nobody else can save you. Nobody else could pay sin's debt for poor lost sinners. He would be yours today. What can I do for Jesus? How may I repay him? Oh, to tell the story of salvation's way. Never a theme for singing. Never a truth for praise. As Jesus' love for sinners, I'll sing it all my days. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for me he died, and the crimson tide proves that he loves me, that Jesus loves me. So sing it again, Jesus loves me. What a Savior. Let's bow our heads together this morning. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he's altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend. Can you say that today? First of all, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Have you had a time when you repented of your sins and received him into your heart and life? You know what, you know what the Bible says in John 1.12? But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Oh, if you'll receive him, God will place you into his family and this wonderful relationship with him can begin. If you're here today, as most of you are, and you're, he's your savior, then is he, is his word important to you? His mouth sweet, his words sweet. How about loveliness? Is he lovely to you? You see, your beloved, your friend, do you like to point him out?
Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts from this verse today. Lord, we've drawn parallels from this verse to New Testament truths about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray today that everyone here that knows you would certainly draw closer to you. There's an old song that says, Just a closer walk with thee. That ought to be the heart's desire of everybody that knows you. We ought to want a closer walk with thee. And Lord, we can have it. You certainly want it with us. It's up to us to have that closer walk with you. Lord, this morning, may we ask ourselves the question, how important are your words in our life? Are you the most lovely, special, important person in our life? Can we call you my beloved we have a personal relationship with you and there's no one to love and to cherish, to adore, to talk about than you. Can we call you my friend, Lord? The friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's what you want to be to every one of your people. Help us to realize that today. And may we be witnesses for you. Have your will and way in this invitation hymn. There may be someone here today, Lord, that doesn't know Jesus is their Savior. I don't know every heart and life here. You do and they do. But knock on that heart's door as we sing this invitation hymn. I pray they might come so we could take the Bible, your words, your wonderful words, and show them how they can have Jesus as Savior today. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Let's